morning, church. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord on this Sunday morning. Let's stand across this sanctuary. We serve a great God who alone is worthy of all the praise. Jesus Messiah. Oh, he became sin.
He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, this morning we just want to worship you. Lord, no, for other reason, not for any other reason except because of who you are. Lord, not for healing, not for provision, not for material things, but God, we worship you just because you are God. Oh, Lord, have your way in the sanctuary today. Touch us today, God. Lord, fill us full of your spirit. Draw us closer to you today, God. Lord, like never before, set us on fire once again with the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, from the back row of the choir to the back of the sanctuary, God. Lord, let your spirit fill every heart and soul. Lord, have your way in this service. Touch us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Oh, you are the Messiah. Hallelujah to your name. Sing it again. Oh, Jesus Messiah.
I'm Daniel Watson, pastor of First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma. We are a local church with a worldwide vision of reaching out to people with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the next few minutes, we want to reach out to you through the messages preached in this broadcast. As you watch this message, we pray that God will speak to your heart and that your life will be forever changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, I will be reading Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse number 1, Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had called privily the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over the young child, over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Down throughout history, God has provided you and I with a road map. He has foretold of various signs and conditions through the prophets of the Old Testament and the Word of God. And these prophets would speak of things that mankind should watch for so that the Messiah would be recognized and so that man would believe on the one that was sent by God. And these signs and prophecies were given to us in the Old Testament. And if you will look into the Word of God, the, the writings of the Old Testament were, were completed 450 years before the time of the birth of Christ. And for 450 years, the world sat in a state of cold, in a state of darkness. There were wondering when is this promised Messiah going to return? When is the promise of God going to be fulfilled? And of all these prophecies that are written in the Word of God, over 300 prophecies concerning who the Messiah is, and yet Jesus Christ is the only one, one man out of 30 billion people that has fulfilled these prophecies. And in the Old Testament, uh, the Word of God has given us 
uh, prophecies that stand out as a sign of the Messiah. And, and, and Nehemiah, or in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, the Bible tells us a specific sign to look for that lets us know when the Messiah is born. In Numbers 24, verse 17, the Bible says, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. The Bible tells us that wise men from the east came seeking for Jesus. And throughout the study of the stars and the revelation of the Holy Spirit through the Old Testament scriptures, these wise men learned that the Messiah, the one and only Savior of this world, the King of Kings, was going to be born in Israel. And that when he is born, there is going to be a star located over Israel when this Messiah comes into existence. And so for many years, these men would watch the night sky, and finally one night there appeared a great star that was brighter than any other star that they had ever seen. And for years they had been waiting, for years they had been searching, and they had longed for the day when they would see that star in the eastern sky, because when they saw that star, that star meant that the Savior of this world, the Messiah has been born, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, has come into this world. You see, these wise men were watching these stars because they had one intention. They were seeking the face of God when He would come to earth as Emmanuel, God with us. And if any of us in this world today has any wisdom, then we too would be seeking the face of God. And so this morning, for just a little while, I want to preach to you on the subject that I'm calling this message, Wise Men Still Seek Him. When these wise men saw the star shining over the land of Israel, they knew that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the King of the Jews had been born. And they began their journey to see this holy child that had been born. And these wise men were not entirely sure exactly what town this Messiah would be born. Although the Word of God does give us uh, the, the explanation of where he's going to be born. That he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But for some reason these wise men did not go to Bethlehem. But they did know that there was a king born in Israel. They did know that a star was shining over Israel. And so where else did they think? a new king would be born. They went directly to the king's palace in Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, that the wise men came into the king's palace and said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. You see, that was the purpose of the visit of the wise men, to worship Jesus. It's no wonder that the Bible calls them the Magi, or the wise men. It was not because of their great knowledge and intelligence, although they were very educated, but that is not what made them wise as far as wise in the Spirit of God. You see, they were wise not because of the knowledge that they had, but they were wise because they sought Jesus, and they sought Jesus for the right reason, just to simply worship Him. And they worship Him because Jesus is worthy of worship. They worship Him because He is the Messiah. They worship Him because He is the Son of God. You see, this was no ordinary baby lying there in the manger in Bethlehem's stable. But this was God Himself. He was robed in flesh. He was fully God and fully man. You see, worship to God is about who He is and not about what He is. Worship is all about who Jesus is. You see, our worship should not be based upon what Jesus has done or what we want Jesus to do. But we worship Him just because of who He is. And these wise men came to worship Jesus. That is what made them wise. And as, as they bow down to worship Jesus, it's not about what Jesus has done in their life. It's not about what He can do. It's not about the miracles, at least not at this point. You see, the miracles had not yet taken place. But we know in the Word of God that Jesus would eventually do what He was sent into this world to do. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, speaking, uh, uh, that this is the angel uh, speaking to Joseph. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But at this point in time, the, the wise men came to worship Jesus only for who He is. They worship Him. Because He is God. No other reason. 
See, they worship Him because He is God manifested in the flesh. That's why John the Baptist tells us in John chapter 3, verse 34 through 36, For He whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto Him. The Father loveth the Son, and has given all things into His hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Jesus Christ was the fullness of God manifested to us in the flesh. In John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John goes on to say in verse 10 through 14 that he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ reveals the fullness of God. In Colossians 2 verse 9, For in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so that is why these wise men came and they wanted to worship Jesus because He was God manifested in the flesh. The great God above, the creator of this universe and all that was within it, the great God above became Emmanuel, God with us. He came to this earth fully God and fully man to show us the way of righteousness. And so these wise men came to the king's palace. And they asked where this new baby boy is that is the king of the Jews. Where is he to be born? And when King Herod heard these things, the Bible says that he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Verse number four says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Let me stop here for just a second. At this point in history, King Herod has no idea whatsoever who Jesus Christ is. It is quite possible that he has understood the fact that the Jews are expecting the coming of a Messiah. It's quite possible that he has heard the possibility of a star that's going to appear because it's already been foretold in the Old Testament. And so when the, the wise men comes to King Herod's palace and they ask him, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? Can you imagine the fear and the terror that Herod began to feel in his life, seated there upon his throne, he thinks, according to Caesar, that he's the king of the Jews. He thinks, according to Caesar, that he is the king of Israel. And all of a sudden, he hears word, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? And Herod's thinking, you've got to be kidding. A true king has been born. I'm going to be removed from my throne. I'm going to think up a plan. I've got, to, I've got to stop this king. I've got to stop this, this king. I'm the king. I'm the one that's been put in charge by Caesar. It's all about me. And so he tells these wise men in verse number five. First of all, he speaks to the, the priest and the elders. He asks them, where is this king going to be born? And the, and the, the priest and the, the uh, scribes, they say, in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet. And thou in Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He had to ask them what time did the star appear. He wanted to know because when Jesus was born, that was when the star was going to appear. He wanted to know an age, an age group here. So what age group is this new king going to be? Is he a newborn or is he a toddler? Has he been around for a year or two? What age is he? And he says in verse number eight, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. 
And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You see, if you notice in the word of God, King Herod claimed that he too wanted to come and worship Jesus. But we know the story. Herod has no intention of worshiping Jesus. In fact, King Herod's desire is to kill Jesus because Jesus would be a threat to King Herod's dynasty and the throne of Israel. And so when Herod said that he wanted to worship Jesus, that was the words that he spoke, and that's all that it was, was just simply words, because his worship was fake. He just wanted to try to make it look good for these wise men, but his worship was fake. You see, these wise men came for one purpose, and that was to worship Jesus for who He is. You see, their worship was not based upon what Jesus could offer them. Their worship was not based on any benefit that they could receive for worshiping Him. But they simply worshiped Him because He is God's Son. And when they arrived at the house, Jesus was probably a young boy. More than likely, He was one and a half years old or possibly two years old. Jesus was not even able to speak to them. He could not give them an eloquent speech. He couldn't carry on a conversation. He, he couldn't even give them anything. He could not give them any counsel. He could not give them uh, anything. It was actually be the other way around. It was the adults that was having to help Jesus. It was the adults that was having to provide for Jesus. And contrary to our American tradition, the wise men did not come to the stable as, as we often uh, show in our traditional nativity scenes. But we do it because... That's the way we want to do it. But these wise men, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, 11, that the wise men came to the house, not the state. Jesus was more than likely two years old or thereabouts at this time. How do we know that? The Bible gives us evidence to look at. You see, these wise men were from the areas of Persia, which includes present-day Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia and all of these countries today are very wealthy countries with, with oil that we purchase every day. And also this was a fulfillment of the promise of God. Uh, God had promised Abraham that he had two sons with promise, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael would go on to become a great wealthy nation. And, and they are today. The Arab world is a wealthy nation. And then the other son, Isaac, it would also become a great nation. That would also be the bloodline and lineage that Jesus Christ would come into this world. But once Jesus was born, this star appeared over Israel. And these wise men traveled for some time through their, their camel caravans. And quite possibly, they traveled maybe one to 2,000 miles. Which going by camel would take many months and quite possibly a year or longer in order to reach their destination. So by the time they arrive in Israel, Jesus could have very well been old enough to uh, not just crawl, but he's probably starting to walk at this time. And Herod asks these wise men, when did the star appear? He's heard about the star. He knew that the star meant that the Savior had been born. And so that is why he ordered all the male children, two years old and younger, to be killed. See, Herod wanted to do everything he can to try to eliminate Jesus Christ from this earth. You see, many people travel great distances to try to fulfill a purpose in their life. We're trying to fulfill some desire. See, some people travel two and a half hours just to go to the favorite restaurant because they want something good to eat. Some people travel long distances to find a place that they want to spend on vacation. Some people travel a long distance to go to a revival or travel a long distance even to attend church. In fact, at the church that I grew up at Van Buren, we had people that traveled. We, we had people that came from all over Arkansas, all over Oklahoma, from, from uh, central Arkansas, from Tulsa. We even had people that drove from Jefferson City, Missouri, all the way to Van Buren every Sunday morning and Sunday night just to be in church. You see, we have people here at Howe Assembly that drive great distances. We have people that come from Hebner. We have people that come from Worcester. We have some that come from Poto. We have some that come. We had a lady here the other night that drove all the way from Waldron just to be here in our Wednesday night service. We have people that drive from Van Buren, from Fort Smith. We had a lady here a few weeks ago that drove from Kibler, which is, who knows where it is. It's way out in the river bottoms, east, east of Van Buren. 
But a church alive is a church that's worth the drive. And so these wise men had come for thousands of miles for one purpose, and that was to worship Jesus. You see, the wise men's worship was not about trying to see what they could get out of their worship, but their worship was about their giving. You see, they did not come to get something from Jesus, but they came to give to Jesus. You see, that's where we mess up so many times in, in our church services. We, we, we come to church and we lift our hands and we cry and we shed tears and we ask God, Lord, give me a blessing, give me some increase, give me this and give me that, and yet we never give Him anything. Amen. You see, the wise men, they came prepared to give. You see, the moment that they decided to make this long journey from the Far East to Israel, they had already started their giving. You see, they were, they were giving of their time. They were giving of their efforts. They were giving of their comforts. They were giving of many things. But one thing, they were giving of their treasures. See, a treasure means something that is very valuable, like a precious metal or a gem. Something that's valuable. Something that means something of worth. See, let, let, me, let me pause right here and touch on something that's very important in regard to our worship. If you look into the Word of God, we see that tithing is a commandment from God. A tithe is a 10% of our increase. It's of our increase. See, no one receives an increase of time. We never do. Every one of us is blessed. Every day of our life, we have 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365.25 uh, days a year. Some of you will get that point twenty five later. But every one of us are blessed with time. Time does not increase with us. So we can't tithe our time. We cannot tithe our efforts. Effort is not an increase of something we see. Effort is something that we put forth. See, a tithe is 10% of our increase. And so Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says, Bring ye all tithes into the storehouse that there may that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That's what the Word of God says. Now let me ask this. What happens if I do not pay my tithe? What happens if I do not give my, my 10% of my increase? What does the Word of God say if I do not do that? Is it really that important? Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 9 says, Will a man rob God? Yet he hath robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Tithing is 10% of our increase, it's, it's our earning. And so when we give, when we worship, we are to give to God. We pay our tithes because it is a requirement unto God. But, and, and we give our time as an offer. We give our talents as an offer. We give to missions as an offering. We give to the church building fund as an offering. We give to the evangelists. We give to needy families as an offering. And all of these offerings are paid beyond what we pay in our tithes. And so these wise men did not come to seek a blessing, but they came to give to the Messiah, the King. And the Bible says that they brought their treasures. They didn't bring something real cheap and petty to Jesus. But they brought their treasure. They brought gifts of gold, gifts of frankincense, gifts of myrrh. And these were gifts that were considered fit for someone who is in royalty in those days. And they were heavy gifts. And I firmly believe that these gifts served a very significant purpose and place in the early life of Jesus. Because when King Herod heard that a king had been born, and he ordered that all boys ages two and under should be killed, the Bible says that God spoke to Joseph in a dream, warning him about the decree of the king, and told him to leave and flee into Egypt and stay there until you're told to return. And so at the whim at this time, Mary and Joseph and Jesus quickly left all of their belongings. They left their home. They left their job. They left everything that they had and moved quickly to Egypt. How are they going to survive? How are they going to live for this amount of days or weeks, months, maybe years? 
God had already provided what they needed to sustain them through the worship of these wise men. If one could easily, easily assume that these gifts helped sustain Mary and Joseph and Jesus on their journey and stay in Egypt until they returned home in Nazareth. You see, when we worship God and when we give to Him, we give to Him what is due Him. We give Him our praise. We give Him the honor. We give Him all the glory because He is worthy of all of our praise. He inhabits the praises of our people and we even give Him our tithes and offerings because we worship Him just because of who He is. You see, that alone is enough reason to travel the long distance and carry the treasures and to take the risks. See, these wise men did exactly that. When Alyssa and I first got married, on Saturday, October 13th of last year, we had left early the next morning, which was on Sunday morning, to make our way to our destination. And it was a week later, and I find it hard to fathom when I look back that we went a whole week without going to church. And uh, so we, we decided that, that on our way coming home that we were going to detour off the beaten trail and stop <coughs> and visit this church in northern Kentucky. And so I did not know how to get there. I had never been in that part of the country. And so I, uh, I had my 90% dependable GPS navigator. And I plugged in the address so that I could hopefully find that church. And so I programmed the address to the church in there. And we left our hotel and we started our journey. Literally, we went over the river and through the woods down one mountain road and the country road. And, and then down this long winding road and finally we made it to the church and when we got there I even remember telling my wife how do people find this place and you have to understand this is the church that runs like four or five thousand people and it's out in the middle of nowhere on a just a two-lane road like what you have right out here in front of Howe Assembly and, and, and so I don't know how people find that church but they do because we pulled in the parking lot and I saw the hundreds of cars out there, and I'm telling you, we had church there. Uh, you, you ain't never seen a worship service till you've been in a, a northern Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains and hearing that Appalachian gospel music. Them people know how to have church. They don't have church, they have church up there. And I'm telling you, when, when uh, you, you may have seen this church, it's Pastor Tommy Bates of uh, Family Community Church in Independence, Kentucky. But I'm telling you, we went there. And so that afternoon, we left the church and we went, toured a couple of museums, and, and I thought, you know. This is our first day to go to church as a newlywed couple. Let's go back tonight. So we turned around and drove another hundred miles to go back to get to that church that night. And I'm glad we did because that Sunday night service, they have three services Sunday morning because they can't get them all into their sanctuary. But then he turns around and does one service on Sunday night. I don't know how they do it, but they get them all in there. But they have chairs that are packed all the way up to the platform. And they have the same kind of chairs that we have here. And when he gave the altar call, the altars, there were so many people coming to the front, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost, that the ushers come up there and, and people that were not getting into the altar service, they were asked, you're going to have to move somewhere else because we're taking all these chairs up so we can make room at the front. Why was it happening? It's because people were hungry for something that was real and they traveled hundreds of miles to get there. And how assembly, I want to tell you something this morning. I believe there is coming a day that there are going to be people that's coming to this church because of the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot manufacture the anointing. You cannot produce the power of God. It is the power of God. It is the real deal. It is the genuine authority that comes from the throne room of heaven. And when we get on fire for God, there is no limit to what God will do in this church. I believe we're going to see people come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and they will be drawn to this place. And I look forward to a day when we have to add everything extra chairs to come up here to the front and when we give an altar call that there's going to be a hunger for so many people to get in touch with God that we're going to tell you if you're not going to pray then just move back we've got to make room for people that are hungry for God to do a work in their life do you believe it today Amen. hallelujah we worship him because of who he is Amen. hallelujah to his name see to worship him is to proclaim the holiness of God in Psalms chapter 96, verse 7 through 9, the Bible says, Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. 
fear before Him all the earth. See, we do, do not misunderstand Him. It is important that we worship Him and praise Him for what He has done and for what He has given us. We must, when we come together and worship, we enter into His gates with thanksgiving in our heart and into His courts with praise. But that kind of worship at times is, is shallow if that's all we're worshiping Him for. That's what we call entry-level worship. It's good that we acknowledge the good that we have received, but it's not enough. Take away the blessings. Take away the benefits. Will we still have a praise? Do we have enough of the spirit of worship in our life to continue to worship? Do we have enough of this worship to worship Him that when we don't have what we need if things are not going well for us in our life? Do we have enough spirit of worship in our life that when the doctor tells us that we have cancer and we have a few short months left to live, are we still going to worship Him? Are we going to worship Him and continue to worship Him if we go to the bank and we find out all the money is gone and the bills are due and we're on the verge of financial collapse? What are we going to do? Do we have enough spirit of worship in our life to worship Him when we find out that our children have been rebelling against God and no longer going to church? See, we must get beyond worshiping Jesus because of what He has done, but begin to worship Him just for who He is because He is our God. He is good. He is kind. He is faithful. He is righteous. He is just and He is holy. See, we worship Him for who He is, not just for what He has given us. And not just for what He has done for us. That we worship Him because He is God. Not because He met our needs. Not because He answered our prayers. Think about this. Would we still worship Him if things were no longer going well in our life? Would we still worship God in the midst of our suffering? Would we still worship Him when, when we have nothing left in our life? You see, is our worship any different depending upon His blessing in our life? See, do we only worship God for what He can do in our life? Absolutely not. See, our worship to God must be based upon no other principle except for who He is. For He is the Lord. He is the Savior. We must get to a point in our life that we worship Him for no other reason except because He is God. There is a song that, that says, Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you just because of who you are. Because He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who reigns in victory. He is Jehovah Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Lord, we worship you because of who you are. See, He is Jesus Christ. And so that alone is enough reason for you and I to come together and worship the King of Kings. See, worship, it's not about tradition. It's not about our wants. It's not about our desires. I get so tired of hearing these churches that say, well, we have a traditional worship. Some say we have a contemporary worship. Some say we have a formal. Some say we have a casual let me tell you something, church. There's no such thing as traditional worship. There's no such thing as contemporary worship. There's no such thing as formal worship. There's no such thing as casual worship. All it is is worship Him in spirit and in truth. Get in touch with God. Let God change you. Let God use you. Let God set your soul on fire. And when you, when you get in touch with God, it makes no difference if it's a new song or an old song or no song at all. It makes no difference if the music's loud, if it's soft or no music at all. Get in touch with God. God, let Him change you. Let Him set you free by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm so tired of people saying, well, if they don't sing my favorite song, I can't get in the service. What are you worshiping? Are you worshiping God or are you worshiping the atmosphere? We must get in touch with Him. If we get in touch with Him, it makes no difference what's going on around us. It makes no difference if I'm sitting beside somebody dressed in a suit or somebody dressed in overalls or somebody that comes in off the street that stinks like who knows what. Get in touch with God and let the things of this world, let God take care of the rest. Let God change it. Let God make the difference. If we would get on our face before Him and worship Him just for who He is and say, Lord, I worship Him because you
because you're my God. Not because it's not because you healed me. Not because you gave me a, 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 a job. Not because of any other reason. But God, I worship you because of who you are. And when we get that kind of worship, God is going to do a work in your life like you've never seen before. See, worship is when we encounter God. See, you can have the finest musicians. You can have the best singers. You can have the latest in music technology. You can have... All the bright colored lights, some churches have them, we don't. But unless you've got Jesus Christ, unless you've got the anointing, all you've got is a bunch of entertainment, a bunch of emotions, but no anointing. You take away all of that, what are you going to have? You take away all of that, all we need is Jesus. As long as I've got King Jesus, I don't need anything else. I don't need all the philosophies. I don't need all the theologies. I don't need all the, the, the psychology of this world. Just give me Jesus and He's enough for me. He's all I need. He's all I need because He's the author of my... He, he's the source of my strength. He's the strength of my life. I depend upon Him. His Word is enough and I can stand upon His Word because that Word is a solid foundation. Let the wind blow. Let hell rage. Let the storms of life come. Jesus is with me and he's going to see me through. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise a standard up against you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Stand to your feet across the sanctuary. Hallelujah to his name. Hallelujah to his name. Lord, we worship you this morning because of who you are. Oh, we adore you, Jesus. We adore Christ the Lord today. Hallelujah to your name. Lord, for no other reason. Lord, we just want to worship you. <laughs> we just want to worship you. Oh. Lord, not because of the profession, not because of the increase in our life, God, we just want to take some time and we just want to worship you just because you're God. Just because you're God. Is there anyone here that wants to come and worship you? Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040. Sunday evenings at 6 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. 
We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.